Give me your signal. Although it took years to perfect, the technique of sending pictures by wire is comparatively simple. Here I return to the Christian hell from the 1st to the 20th century by Hypatia Bradler Bonner, published in 1913, at Chapter 5, Visions and Descriptions. Through the teaching of the theologians, hell became very real to Christians, and a great number of visions of purgatory and hell are seriously recorded by the monks and poets of the Middle Ages. One of the earliest is the pilgrimage of Fersius, or Fersi, related by Bede in his Ecclesiastical History. Fersius lived in the 7th century and was an Irishman of noble and wealthy family, conspicuous for his piety in his boyhood and in course of time becoming a holy man, remarkable for his singular virtues. At length he fell ill and seemed at the point of death. In this condition his soul started on its perilous journey, conducted by an angel who showed him the four fires which will burn the world. The first is for those who have loved falsehood. The second is for the avaricious. The third for the stirrers up of strife and discord. The fourth for the fraudulent and impious. All these fires met to form one immense flame which the angel caused to divide in order to make a clear path for Fersius. But the unclean spirits were angry at his intrusion and hurled one of the damned at him, striking him upon the shoulder and the jaw, and burning him where he was touched. The holy man luckily escaped without further injury, and was afterwards restored to life and health. But all his life he bore the mark of the fire which he had felt in his soul, visible to all men on his shoulder and jaw, and the flesh publicly showed in a wonderful manner what the soul had suffered in private. Another vision reported by Bede is that of the Northumbrian Drithelm, whose soul was taken to purgatory by a shining angel. He saw a valley, one side of which was filled with dreadful flames and the other side no less horrid, for violent hail and cold snow were flying in all directions. Both places were full of souls, which were tossed from one side to the other as by a wild storm and were thus tormented alternately, now by excessive heat, and now by cutting cold. He next came to a region of extreme darkness in which suddenly appeared frequent globes of black flames rising and falling in a great pit. These globes were full of human souls, which gave forth an insufferable stench, filling all those dark places. Several friends rushed at Drithelm and beset him on all sides, frightening him with their glaring eyes and the stinking fire which proceeded from their mouths and nostrils. His angel, however, rescued him, and after showing him the antechamber to heaven, and then heaven itself, he found himself on a sudden once more alive and among men. Although Fursey was the first, he was by no means the only Irishman to visit the lower regions. Indeed, the place of punishment seems to have had a special attraction for the sons of Erin. Tundale was born at Cashel, and like Fursey, came of a noble family. But unlike Fursey, he was proud wicked and cruel, lavishing money on jesters instead of giving it to the church. One day, sitting at meat in a friend's house, after having given way to a fit of rage, he fell down to all appearance dead, and so remained from Wednesday to Saturday, when he revived and related his experience. The story of Tundale was for long immensely popular, and the version consulted for this book is taken from the a very nice edition prepared by W. B. W. D. Turnbull from a manuscript in the Advocates Library, Edinburgh, and published in 1843. The illustration is from the engraved frontispiece to this edition. Tundale tells how, attended by his guardian angel, he came to a deep dark valley, the bottom full of burning coals, in which was a great cauldron, and in it the souls of parricides, fratricides, and other homicides were melted and then strained, as molten wax is strained through a cloth. Then he saw devils with forks and tongs of glowing iron, tossing wretched souls alternately into fire and cold snow. He saw many dreadful things, and sinners of all kinds. Even he saw within that dungeon many men of religion, 
that foul were of foul venom, both withouten and within, strong venom in him he saw, and on every limb bitten and gnaw. Horrified at all these dreadful sights, Tundale reminds his angel guide of the word that written was, that God's mercy was everlasting, Psalms 5, for he can see none of it. That word, replied the angel, hath deceived many a man, and he goes on to explain at some length that although God is merciful, he is also just, and without fear of God's anger, the guilty would have no inducement to repent of their sins. So that Tundale might fully realise the extent of God's mercy, the angel shows him more horrors. He saw a, a wonder hideous beast that swallowed those souls that were ready, digested them and ejected them into a lake where they became souls again. There worms and serpents and other vermin bred in them and tormented them exceedingly. Fro het to fot, a was gnawing, scratching, fretting, flaying and stinging, to heaven the noise might have been heard. There were the souls of monks, priests and nuns, who had not led holy lives, and so moved was he at seeing them that poor Tundale said to the angel bright, Lord, this is a dreadful sight. But that was by no means the worst. He was taken further and shown a great smithy, where the demon smiths seized him with their tongs and cast him into the midst of the fire, which they blew with bellows until he was molten. Thousands of other souls were fired with him, and when they were molten and glowing red, they were treated as men shall temper iron and steel. That is, the molten souls were placed upon an anvil and hammered into one mass. Tundale was at length delivered from this torment by his angel guide, who then promised to show him still greater pains. Souls in pain out in end. He came to a place so cold that he was near frozen to dead and so dark that he was full of fear. He saw more souls burning to ashes, and also Satan, that lithe bound in hell ground, whom he describes at considerable length. Poor Satan was bound down with red-hot chains onto a sort of large gridiron, and a great multitude of demons blew up the fire under him. Tortured in this way, he roared with fury. He twisted and turned, and in his agony he stretched out his twenty-fingered hands and seized a crowd of souls, crushing them in his hands as a thirsty man would crush grapes to squeeze out the juice. When he groaned, souls flew out of his mouth and were scattered far and wide over hell. But as he drew in his breath once more, he swallowed them again with pitch and brimstone. When Tundale had seen all the sights of hell and seen in sorrow and strife men that were of wicked life, the angel took him to visit the realms of bliss inhabited by those who abide God's will. The details of this visit are outside the scope of this work, and are moreover quite unexciting as compared with those of the pilgrimage to hell. When the last word of the story is told, the conscientious editor adds, Be it true or be it false, it is as the coop he was. The descent into hell of yet another Irishman, Heinous Owen or Owain, in 1153, is related by Henry of Saltry and Matthew Paris. The legend became very popular and was soon translated into other languages. There are at least three early French metrical versions. Owen was a soldier and had served long in the wars of King Stephen. Having obtained leave to return to his native land, he was suddenly struck with remorse for the life of rapine and violence which he had led. With the license of his bishop, he determined to do penance in the purgatory of St. Patrick in Loch Derg, in the hope of finding pardon for his sins. The story of this visit he told to Gilbert, abbot of Louth, who repeated it to many persons. At last Henry, a Benedictine monk of the Abbey of Saltry, wrote it down. Owen's story differs from others of the same character in one important particular, viz. that he visited hell in the flesh, while the others were visits of the soul. As might be expected in his pilgrimage through hell, he was constantly exposed to the assaults of fiends, but invariably escaped by the utterance of the sacred formula. Jesu, as thou art full of might, have mercy on me, sinful knight. He saw people of every age and of both sexes nailed to the ground with red-hot nails, and being whipped by devils, men, women and children boiled in cauldrons, people lying on their backs with fiery dragons, flaming serpents and toads dining upon their bowels, people hung on iron hooks, driven through their feet, hands, eyes, nostrils, ears or navels over flames of burning sulphur. 
and so on. From each of these torments Owen himself escaped by calling Jesus to his aid. On leaving hell he passed through paradise, where he much desired to remain. But this being forbidden, he found his way back to the entrance of the cave, where he was met by priors and canons to whom he told his story. Visions of hell and purgatory seem to have had a horrid fascination for Matthew Paris, for he tells of several. There is, for example, the story of the monk of Evesham, who on Good Friday in the year 1196 fell sick and lay for many days in a comatose condition, during which he had visions of the sufferings of the damned. He saw a wicked goldsmith who was compelled to everlastingly count out gold coins and swallow them, and other sinners beaten out like metals at a white heat. Some of his descriptions do not bear repetition. They are the outcome of an obscene mind. He compares the multitude of people he saw in hell with a swarm of bees in a hive, and among the damned he recognized many of his own former acquaintances. Ten years later, in 1206, as Matthew Paris also relates, a simple husbandman named Thurkill, living in a village in Essex, was taken on a visit to the underworld by St. Julian, the hospitator, who tells him to leave his body in the bed while his soul comes with him. One of the earliest things seen by Thurkill, quite natural in an agriculturist, was a place of punishment for those who had been slow in paying their tithes. In one hell, Thurcell saw St. Michael with St. Peter and St. Paul. Here the souls, which were perfectly white, were handed over to St. Michael, who conveyed them in safety to the Mount of Joy. Those who were spotted black and white fell to St. Peter, by whom they were sent to purgatory, while St. Paul and the devil sat at either end of a large pair of scales in which were weighed the black souls. When the saint's scales turned down, he sent the soul to purgatory. When the devil's scale was the heavier, he and his attendants threw the soul into a fiery pit. The devils took Thursil and his attendant saints to see one of their stage plays in which a number of punishments were shown. The seats were of red-hot iron, occupied by naked souls chained around the waist, who were seized as required to play a part on the stage. Thursil, like all the other visionaries, recognized amongst the damned persons whom he knew. In his story also there are descriptions which may be suited to a monastery, but are quite unfit for lay reading. From hell he visited heaven, saw the blessed and number of saints, and after two days and two nights returned to his body at home, and next day recounted to the priest and his neighbours all the wonders which had been revealed to him. In the visions of Tundale, Owen, Thursill, and others, we find mention of a bridge which the souls have to pass over. This forms no part of the New Testament hell, but it is an important feature in the hells of many of the Eastern religions. And we'll take a break there. Give you a rest. Leave you on a cliffhanger. I think that one's long enough. Second half of this chapter is only going to be about five minutes, and it gets good. Please rate if you can, comment if you can figure out how to, and thanks as always for watching.